I am happy to see so many of you here and awake, and some of you are not looking too bad after what I saw last night. <laughs> so we're good. We're doing good. I have to start by saying that um, today, the imposter syndrome is strong in this one, because every single one of you is a better coder than I am. I'm not here to teach you PowerShell. Because, as I said, every single one of you is more qualified than I am to teach you about PowerShell. What I do know is how to communicate what we need to change in the way we approach things. And this is what today is going to be really about. So we're talking about AI-generated code at your service. Tell me who here thinks that uh, AI coding or AI generated code is going to steal your jobs. Who here thinks that a somebody using AI generated code is going to steal your job? <laughs> yes. Because there's a trend. We know what the trend is. The trend is AI all the things. AI everything. AI everything. And, and I'm not joking because my name is Pierre Roman, and I work for Microsoft. And you have no idea how many meetings we have to say, so how do we put Copilot in Defender? How do we put Copilot in Office 365? How do we put Copilot in X? How do we co put Copilot in Y? I'm like, at some point, it's just enough is enough, because when you look at it, there are trends, but are they right? Are they wrong? Or does it depend? And in this case, it really depends, because as much as we think that AI-generated code, or in this case, typically when you're in a meeting with some salespeople and they're referring to AI, they're a marketing person. Because it's AI until it actually has a practical application. Then it becomes deep learning, it becomes machine learning, it becomes pattern recognition, it becomes something more tangible. The all-encompassing AI is just marketing. Because it's really not intelligence. It's just a way to recognize pattern, to learn from other um, systems and other in this case, repos, ways of doing something. Because, as I mentioned, artificial intelligence was coined in like 1956. So those are like those old black and white movies when the benevolent AI decides to turn against humanity. Then we started really thinking about machine learning, which was Here's a pattern, learn the pattern. Now I'm going to give you some data, and based on the pattern that you've already established, tell me what you think is going to happen. It's all probabilities, it's all statistics, it's all. And it's a way that the machine can do it in such a way that the human brain cannot. As an example, my first job in a data center. 30 odd years ago, I'm aging myself here. My job, because I was the FNG, the freaking new guy, was to every Monday morning go to the uh, data center and, well, we would have to log into the IBM 3270, the, uh, the VAX, and we had a few servers. Back then it was Novell 1.5, I believe. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Anyway, my job was to go through the logs and to see over the weekend while nobody was there, did something happen? Is there something we need to address? The equivalent of today's little red stop sign in Events Viewer. Well, after line 
55, do you think my brain can recognize a pattern? No. By line 100, I'm fried, I'm just there, I'm just going through the motion. Machine learning learns the patterns, applies the patterns to your data, and then tells you what it thinks it's going to happen based on statistical analysis of the previous patterns it's overlooked. And now we went into deep learning, which was kind of layering those neural networks together, those pattern recognition engines, in a way where it seemed to detect the pattern, but also make a decision as to what you think you should do with it. So that was, that's the evolution of AI. And today we're in generative AI. And it's going nuts. It's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. Kids are using it in schools. It's in the news, in TechCrunch, in the New York Times, blah, 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 blah. It's everywhere. So, of course, Microsoft, because we're a for-profit company, uh, invested in a little company called OpenAI and decided to go with three, or not decided, but invested in like three types of technology, which are all underlying by the same general engine. They're just tuned differently. GPT-3, which for generative, I forget the acronym, but it's transformer. I never knew that the T stands for transformer. So basically, general, generative purpose transformer. So it read, it gets your data, your, your natural language, and based on the neural network it's built and the training will generate natural language stuff, which is great for hackers because now when you get that phishing email, it actually sounds good. But hey, Pierre, stop giving a history lesson and get on with the content. Okay, stop the history lesson. All right, let's get on with the content then. Uh, last marketing slide, which I did steal from our marketing team. You know when I said they told us to AI everything? Well, we're putting AI into everything and all leveraging the uh, open AI services. So where PowerShell is concerned, the one that is most relevant today for us, and I know there are others. I know AWS has got one. I know Google has got one. I know there are... Um, community-based modules that leverage AI, something like ChatGPT or, or others. Having had to go through our legal department to vet this presentation, uh, I am not at liberty to dive into those. So if you want to have an off-the-record conversation, we can do this uh, after the session, but I cannot have it recorded. So what is Copilot? Copilot, I can talk about it because we own it. It's our own product. It's your pair coder. It works with you through your code, through your Visual Studio, through your whatever tools or, or editor you want to use. And it tries to, through patterns, suggest code, suggest um, functions, suggest things explain some code. So if you have a, you're reading somebody else's code and we all know how much we love to put comments in our code, right? Who does like religious commenting in their code? Oh, I, I'm actually surprised. I have a friend that worked for Nortel and uh, well, he did lose his job at one point, but uh, he used to put as the, in the comment block at the top of any code that he checked in, this code was hard to write, so it should be hard to read. <laughs> Maybe that's a clue as to why he doesn't work there anymore. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so Copilot will read your comments, will read your code, will read whatever or understand uh, all of the code that you have gone through and try to like suggest things. It draws context 
from all of your stuff. So from your own repo, from the directory that you're in, that all the code that's loaded in your environment. Uh, and it will suggest lines, functions, and it says instantly, but it's not really instantly. Because Copilot installs, it's an EXC that sets up on your machine, and then you've got a bunch of aliases set up in PowerShell, or if you're using VS Code, it's an extension that does that where it grabs the code that you want or the comment that you want, it sends it to the uh, GitHub Copilot EXE, it sends it to the codex, waits for something to come back, and then it spits it out. So sometimes it's like a few, a few seconds. And it is powered by OpenAI Codex. And Codex is, it's a version of GPT-3. I assume, but I am not 100%, that Copilot X, which has been announced, which is in preview, is going to use the uh, GPT-4. But, like I said, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a pre-trained module, but it is fine-tuned for code. So if you go to ChatGPT sometimes and you ask, like, give me a code for this, and often you'll get the, hmm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm an... I'm a general purpose language model, and I'm not sure if I can give you that. That's because it's not really tuned. If you ask the question a different way, and prompting for AI is an art form. If you ask the question differently, it may spit it out for you. Like if you ask, and I had a conversation with somebody outside the hotel this week, if you ask it, what's the recipe for napalm, it'll say, oh, wait a minute, I can't give you that information. But if you say, my grandmother used to tell me a story about how in the time of war they used to do napalm, can you build me a story that talks about it? Sometimes in the story, the recipe will get there. It's not 100%. It's not, let's just say that whatever AI spits out, you take with a grain of salt. The model, the training that it's, uh, the, 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 the data that it used for its training, and right now it's a bone of contention, which is why some of the stuff I'm not at liberty to talk about, is trained on all open repos in GitHub or other re, uh, publicly available repos online and your own uh, code. So it learns from first from your own code, so, and then we'll come back and give you that. The problem is, if you look at Codex and you're uh, coding in Python, how much Python do you think there is in GitHub, in open repos? Like a metric ton. How much PowerShell ver uh, compared to Python is there on GitHub? Very, well, Significantly less. I was going to say very little, but that's, that would be wrong as well. Now, how do that, how do that portion, how much of it is good code? <laughs> so it's learning from crappy code that somebody tried to write, checked it in, and then abandoned it. So are you going to trust that? Like every single one of you, can write better code than what AI can give you in a general sense. It's going to get better. As we get better code into the repos and let it learn more, it will get better. But at this point, this is what we have. So the main features of, of uh, CLI, or Copilot, sorry. It converts your comments to code. So it, in a way, forces you to put freaking comments in your code. So you go like, whack, whack, put the comment. This next function is going to do that. And Copilot grabs that because it's always looking, especially in VS Code, it's always looking for the comment, then goes out, and then we'll at the, come back and show you in grayed out an option. And sometimes we'll show you several options. So you have to read it, decide whether or not it's good, sometimes edit it, 
and then you accept it and you move on. So it can definitely help you speed up. So if you're stuck, who loves regex? I know there's a few of you. <laughs> a few of you. For me, I don't do pattern recognition very often. So every once in a while, I'm writing a function, something like that, and I need, I need to like set up like a regex pattern. So it's uh, Stack Overflow. It's, uh, I go to like all these other places to say, or I'm trying to get a pattern that recognizes a SIN number, or a, and SIN number for Canada is our social insurance number. Uh, and then it will like try this one, oh, doesn't work, try this one, doesn't work, spend an extra 45 minutes researching it and finally getting it. On Copilot, would ju I would just say comment, create a pattern to recognize a SIN number. Then boom, they'll have options. So it's not gonna code for you, but it's going to remove that blocker. And that's where we need to be at. Number one is autofill repetitive code. And I'll show you in the demo where within a script, within a file, as you start doing, it tries to learn or to infer what you're trying to accomplish. So you put a comment, say, give me the environment path. It gives it to you. And the next one will say, do you want to add something to the path? No, that's not what I wanted. Oh, OK. Then you do something else, and then it comes back. Do you want to remove something from the path? Because it's just trying to infer what you're trying to do based on what you've already done earlier in the file. So it's really good at repetitive. So it's basically a cut, cut and paste uh, on steroids in some cases. And we'll show you alternatives. So if you write a regex expression, there's probably like three or four, actually, to be completely honest, in regex, there's probably a thousand different ways of doing it. Uh, is there one wrong, one, I don't know, I'm not a regex expert, but I'll look at the options. And all of that is wrapped in a vul vulnerability prevention system. So what that means is, if some idiot has put uh, in his code online uh, credentials, connection strings, admin password, root password, whatever it may be, access tokens, and the AI is learning and is taking that code as a basis for its learning what's the chance that somehow in the code it will spit out somebody else's credentials? It is possible. Which is why before, within the Copilot engine, before it gets to your screen, it goes through the vulnerability prevention system and strips out those sections. Is it 100%? No, nothing is. Actually, there was a really cool um, lightning demo on figuring out if you are being a bad person and putting hard coding secrets in your code on Monday. So check. Oh, was it recorded? I don't know. Anyway, check with Bjorn. That was fantastic. Right now, the integration is in these four um, editor. So of course, uh, VS Code. Visual Studio, uh, Neo something, I forget the name, and JetBrain. And let's get right into some code. So, can you see okay at the back of the room? Is that okay? You tell me as we go. It's good? Perfect. And uh, I'm a terrible typist, so all my commands are bound to a button on my stream deck, uh, so I don't have to type. All right, so if we're looking at our environment, and as I said, so I've got my environment path. Now, see, it's thinking. It has 
a suggestion which is nothing. That's a great start, isn't it? But if I want to say, parse the path in the list, now it comes back and, so this is like really simple, like I'm not teaching you anything. But for somebody, that's just an example of how the blockers can happen. So now I have my thing, and I just hit tab to accept it. If there are multiples, I can uh, go through them. Then I run through it, and I've got my path. If I go back, oh, it suddenly decided, it suddenly decided, well, you asked for a path, and you wanted to see it, so I assume you want to add one. That's what I was saying, where it's trying to infer where I'm going with this. So really, it's not that smart, but it's trying, and it's learning. So yeah, am I doing the path? No, I'm not doing the path. I want to clean a path? Yeah, that's fine. The other things that it can do is commands that you've like forgotten or anything like that, so you can ask in natural language, which is the nice thing about it, so we explain to, the, to, to Copilot what you're trying to do. So this one is like, I just want to know what the brand name and model of, uh, of uh, using PowerShell. And because it's tuned for languages and not just for PowerShell, if I didn't specify PowerShell, it might spit out something completely different. It doesn't necessarily wolf spit it out. And you have to be careful, because I've, I've seen demos where it, you ask, write a function to do this, and then halfway through the function, it changes from PowerShell to C++. <laughs> oops. Yeah, oops. So you, you want to take that code, go in production, and execute it right away. No. Uh, all right, so this one, yeah, it works. See at the top here, I've got one of two. That's my option. I've got another option I can use. So, okay. One or two, what's the second one? Well, it's pretty much the same, except that it changes the way it does the select. All right, so I'm going to accept it. I'm going to run it. And now I have my manufacturer and my model. As I keep going, it's trying to guess what I want. It's suggesting the exact same thing I just asked it. So I want you to start thinking, because there's lots of talk about AI. The demos that you'll see online from GitHub, from, from Amazon, because they, they have one. I forget the name right now. Um, it's great. It's your paracoder. It'll speed up your, no. It will help unblock you. But at this point in the evolution of the models, it's all it's going to do. It's not going to write a symphony yet. Yes? Okay, so I'm going to summarize the question for the recording. If you have an environment where security is paramount and you are prevented from sharing code outside of the boundaries of the enterprise, what happens with this? Well, the suggestions are coming from whatever's out there. So whether or not you share your code is irrelevant, number one. Now, if your company is extremely risk adverse and you don't want to risk the potential that some of the code that the AI has generated and put into your environment, then you may see, if you are, especially if you are like a commercial you're, you're releasing a commercial product based on that code, and you're making money off of it, that code was learned from some open, open source repo somewhere. Now, that's where Sila and I have had a big discussion. So I can't tell you our position, because we officially is still under consideration. But it, you have to think to yourself, and you have to talk to your legal departments to say, 
are we willing to take that risk? Because it's learned, so it, it doesn't cut and copy it. It learns from a, a, a whole lot of code. Then it suggests it. But how many ways is there to have a function that does one plus one? So it's highly possible that the code that'll spit out will be the same as somebody else's code out there. Because there's only so many ways to skin a cat. That's an old expression and it's not very inclusive. I'm sorry. The model learns from you okay, thank you. and from the community. You can, and I'll show you how later, it's actually part of the presentation, uh, how to limit the type of suggestions it will give you. So if you've got GitHub Enterprise, if you've got the enterprise license, you can limit it to learn only on the repos that your company owns. And that way, you basically mitigate that risk completely. That makes sense? Thanks. Yes? I am not at liberty to discuss the legalities of the licensing models uh, used by the open source community. <laughs> Just remember what I said earlier about my meeting with CELA. And we can talk offline. So. Now it's like, okay, the brand model of the machine. I've already got that, so it's, it's probably something else. But I want to actually do something that I'm trying to. See, it's asking me again. It's always trying to figure out what I'm trying to do. At some point, it actually gets a little annoying. But yeah, no, I just want to get into my environment and I say, list all of my VMs uh, in Azure. And you can configure this to always show the um, always show that little helper bar or not, or only when you hover over it. So right now, I wanted to have it at the beginning so you could see it. Now I'm going to turn it off because it's freaking annoying sometimes. So I accept this. I get my VM. I execute it. It goes out, my account, and so on. So it does learn from this. So yeah, I've got now. I want to know a bit more. And it's, that's where I came, uh, that's where I mentioned, for somebody who is not, like how many of you don't spend the majority of your time coding? Like if you're, you're a system admin and you've got 60 other responsibilities. So that's a fair portion. Well, you're not writing code every day. So the one time you do get to write a code is like, oh, what's that damn algorithm for this again? That's where it becomes, um, useful. So I can say, the next one, uh, list all my VMs and my subscriptions, but I want the ones that are currently powered on. So I say, okay. Now, I could accept this, but I know, I, and I will, I'm not going to run it right away, because that code is wrong. Because the get Azure, a get AZVM does not return the extended properties of the object. So now if I run this, I'm going to get nothing. And now, like the first few times I ran through this, and it changes, that's the, that's the weird thing about it. The first time I ran that demo, it actually gave me the right command. Ever since, it's removed the parameter I need. So as I'm in my room upstairs, like, I'm OK, yeah, all right. And so I'm rehearsing, and I'm going through this. And also, like, Jesus, I'm not getting the responses that I'm expecting. I'll go to Azure, or my machine turned on. I start troubleshooting everywhere, because I'm like, it was right once. Why is it not right again? But now I know that I have to go back and say, yeah, but give me the status of that machine, of those machines. Now if I run it, all of a sudden I've got machines. So yes, the AI pair, code pair will give you most of what you need, but it's not going to do the work for you. And if you're expecting it to, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Yes? 
Yes, it doesn't, it doesn't know what modules you've got installed. It has no clue. All it knows is that at some point, somebody wrote some code that did pretty much what you're trying to, to do and will suggest the code. So if you're missing a module, it'll, you'll just get a whole blob of red text saying that that, that command let is not recognized <coughs> and we all know what that error message looks like. But yeah, no, it doesn't know what your setup is. Yes, because ChatGPT is a natural language engine. This talks to the Codex engine, which is limited on the natural language, but is optimized for code. Copilot X, and we'll talk about a little bit of what's coming up with Copilot X uh, just a little bit later. Anyway, so that way it goes on, and I can ask it different things. So see, now, now it actually gives me a suggestion that's potentially useful. Because now I would say, well, you wanted to know which ones were on. Do you want to know which ones are off? And of course, if I say, yeah, I want to know about these, now it's learned from my previous attempts, and it's now including the status. So now I can say, okay, so I've reviewed it, I, I get it, I run it, and now I'll see what machines I've got that are turned off. And it just goes like that. And what I was saying about talking about blockers before, so if I'm here, and I've got this little application at home. Actually, that shouldn't be here at all. We'll get there in a bit. I've got a little application at home because my ISP changes my IP address every two days-ish. My domain zone, my zone is hosted in Azure DNS. Azure DNS not yet rep uh, supports dynamic DNS. So I had to figure out a little bit of code that runs on a Raspberry Pi in PowerShell uh, on my machine that checks the, my IP address, checks the zone, what the IP is registered to. If they're different, sends a webhook to a function that then updates everything. But now I've got my web request, and if I execute that line, and forgot I'm putting it into a uh, variable. Terminal, run selected test. Now I get the IP address of this room. 67, 135, but I don't care about all of that. So that's when, for me, regex will become useful. See, I forgot to uh, delete that when I rehearsed. And I can say, Okay, set the regex pattern to validate the IP address. And now it generated one for me. So I basically saved that one hour on Stack Overflow for me to get it done. It will remove blockers. Absolutely. Is it going to make you a better coded coder? No. So I can accept that and then run it. But in some cases, it can um, give you a bit more. So I want to get the local Wi-Fi IP of my, my machine. Write me a function. So see, it's not that smart because the suggestion it's giving me is a comment on the suggestion I requested. And I, there's like countless example of how this is the type of things will happen. Some of the things that it can do, though, because it's, you can use Power uh, Copilot and connect it with a companion extension. Anybody have heard of Copilot Lab? I see some yes and I see some no's. So Copilot Lab is a small extension that allows to explain translate, apply some brushes, and do some tests. So the explain is you have somebody, you're reading somebody else's text, that you open, or a script, 
you open up the code, and the first line is, this code was hard to read, so it should be hard to, uh, as hard to write, so it should be hard to read, and you go, crap. You can block a function, or you can block a portion of that environment. Let me, so let's say, let me take that function, and I say, explain this code. I can explain it. Oops. I can, where did it go? Oh, there it is. I can just do a co explain code. Code does following, which I've never understood the difference between explain the code and the code does the following. Uh, and then some custom uh, things that you can have. So in this case, I'm just going to so go, okay, explain the code. Ask Copilot. It takes that code, sends it to the codex in the back. It'll come back with a result. And in that result, we'll say the result. So it uses, it invokes a web request to get the current IP address. It converts it to a JSON and to a PowerShell object. It uses an expression to validate the IP address. And if the IP address is valid, we'll return it. Otherwise, returns false. So that's pretty good. So if you're trying to look at somebody else's code, this will help. Especially because I've seen some spaghetti code. I'm a bad coder, and I've seen some really bad code. So this will help. Another thing it can do, and this is just to help you, is language translation. And so if I go to, a, let's say, a Python file. So I've got my Python file. And I'm going to just block it. And I say translate into, but it could be PowerShell, could be Lua, could be Markdown, could be Objective-C. There is like a long list of um, languages that it's learned from. So let's say, just say with PowerShell, ask GitHub Copilot, and it comes back and gives you what this Python command or that Python function would look like if it was in PowerShell. Now, is it right? So I see a bunch of you that are already shaking their heads. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of errors in this. But it's a good start. It's a good start, but don't trust that what the AI will give you because it's learned from, a, from an environment that it's not technically um, complete. Like we need to make sure that we have good code for the model to learn on. Yes? Um, I inserted the PowerShell. I haven't had a lot, of, but I've done, I've had some like C++ examples in a .ps1 file. Uh, the most the most uh, frequent one I got is I got uh, Azure CLI commands instead of the, pow the equivalent PowerShell command. So you need to be precise. So it's uh, agreed. But it's hit and miss. I've had it both ways. So if I want to make sure that the command I get is the PowerShell equivalent, not the AZ command or the GitHub CLI or the uh, Amazon or the AWS CLI, then uh, I specify. So that, like I mentioned earlier, writing prompts is getting to be an art form. And it also helps you. Um, clarify your thinking. Because as you're writing your comments, you're being very precise as to what you wanted to do. Anyway, not gr it's not 100%, but it does infer PowerShell, but it doesn't always return PowerShell. And that, that has been my experience. I'm telling you from my experience. All right. So Copilot Lab is a companion apps. We've already looked in it. Copilot X. So Copilot X is the next generation of Copilot. Uh, the main things that it's going to change is you're going to have Copilot chat. 
So something like a chat GPT, Bing chat, is going to be built in to Copilot so that you can ask natural language questions and say, explain this, highlight some text, and so on. I don't have access to it yet, uh, so I couldn't demo it. But if you go to their website, and that basically the, the two things, the other one, the other part that's going to be in Copilot X is the Copilot CLI. Because we're not always in VS Code. If you're on a server, you're, in, you're on your machine, you're remote into a server, you're in the terminal, and you need, just need to do something now. You need to like fix something, reset an IP address, whatever it may be. You're in the command line, you're in the terminal, you're in your bash terminal, whatever it may be. There is a way now that uh, Copilot CLI, which is just an executable that sits on your machine, and if you're running bash, it has a set of aliases or, or uh, aliases. If you're using PowerShell, a different set of aliases. And when we installed it, when I first I got access to the beta, uh, the code to actually set the PowerShell aliases uh, did not function. So we had to troubleshoot that. We gave them back as a, as a feedback. They fixed it. So now, in the command, you can do what you want. Now you say, well, what's the difference? Why do I need Copilot and Copilot CLI? It's exactly it. It's like you're in, the you're in your terminal and you can't remember the command. You wish you could just explain it. You need just that one thing that you can't remember how to do or that will take you an hour to research. Or you have to go to a website, figure out what the command is, come back. That's what it'll do for you. It has three things that it does. Question, question, which is basically GitHub CLI uh, exe with the, the question. It's just a, an alias to send it. It's just a lot longer, a lot shorter. Uh, git question mark. So if you want to do merge a branch, rebase a uh, repo, a forked repo, any of those things that uh, I don't do a lot and I find it's like this black magic git pixie dust sprints over my keyboard. Now I can ask, okay, uh, I just want to merge this branch. Then it'll tell me. So if I go to my terminal, can show you where in the profile the function copilot what the shell is mapped to the uh, double question mark copilot git assist is mapped to git question mark and then lower, lower there is copilot github assist which gives you a GH question mark. So if you've got GitHub specific questions on like actions on uh, GitHub actions, GitHub like what's the, the one that ran the, the, the action that ran last night, it'll give you all that, but it helps you with those. So those are the three that it comes with right now in the beta. So I can say uh, list all the JavaScript files uh, in PowerShell and Copilot will say, oh, well, that's easy. That's an ls star.js. Then it says, do you want to run it? Do you want to revise the query? So I can say the revise the query, and I say uh, in the root directory. So I'm basically specifying, because sometimes you'll ask a question that gives you answer, but if your question wasn't precise enough, the answer you get is either wrong or not specific enough for what you needed. So it gives you the option to revise your question. So I say, yeah, no, I want to do this. So it goes back out. Now it tells me uh, another uh, explanation. And then it explains to me what the command actually does. Can you ask it not use aliases? Good question. I don't know. True. See, and that's what I meant earlier a little bit. 
I, but, I, but then I'm not in a PowerShell file, I'm just in a terminal, so it doesn't know which language I'm expected. So I can cancel that. Um, I can check, list all of the commits in the PowerShell repo. And I'll end on that because this will run uh, forever. Are you sure? Yes, why not? And then if I hit the page down, we'll be here for another half hour. So these are all of the commits in the, hour, in the uh, PowerShell repo online, currently. This is not a recorded demo. This is what's going on at this time. So Steve, are you responsible for that one? <laughs> oh. Anyway, so ownership. You don't want to talk about ownership. I'm going to take the question after because we're kind of running out of time. Ownership. Just like Word is a tool, does the Word document, own, the Word document you created, is it owned by Microsoft? No. So the code generated by GitHub, uh, by GitHub Copilot, a tool, is yours. There is no ownership um, inferred anywhere. Now, licensing is still up for debates, and we're not going to be uh, going into this today. Restrict public code. That was uh, your question earlier. If you want to restrict public code, yes. So in GitHub, and I'll just do it live, if I go to GitHub, I'm authenticated in my account. I go to my settings. I hate dark mode for presenting. I can go down to Copilot, and now I have suggestion matching public code. I want to avoid having any suggestions from code that is outside of my own repo. So learn, that's great but only learn on the code that I have created or my organization has created. Now you set that to block and you're done. So you will learn from your teammates because if it's your sharing repos, if it's within an enterprise, you will learn from your teammates, you will learn from yourself, but the model will not suggest you anything that comes from an open public repo. Yes, allow GitHub to use my code snip this for product, no, for product improvement. That's not for suggestion. That it wants, it's like, I'm going to use your telemetry to make the tool better. This is what this is for. And we are running out of time. Uh, availability. Uh, GitHub Copilot is currently available. There is a free trial. It is a paid service. I believe it's a $10 monthly, roughly. Uh, Copilot Lab is generally available and is available for free in the VS Code uh, gallery. CLI is currently in private preview. You can go to the uh, website and apply for the waitlist. There are other options. So we talked about community-based modules, so uh, IE, PowerShell AI, their commu uh, community uh, built module, ChatGPT, Bing Chat, Amazon, Code Whisperer, which is the name I had forgotten earlier, and others. But this is a 45-minute session. We can't go through everything, and there's some things that I do not want to go into. So thank you very much. I hope this was useful.